a very good evening everybody my name is annapurni and i'm from chennai so today i'm going to tell you an original fiction story written by me do you all want to hear the story yes long long ago before man existed before the universe was made the primordial god called erebus lived alone he lived in the stillness of space and nothingness this god the god of nothing and everything at once was content nothing perturbed it but millions and millions of years later something began to change something was growing inside it a restlessness a gnawing feeling of something missing this growing worrisome feeling led to a giant explosion of its inner self yes the big bang a giant explosion of matter which created the universe and with this erebus gained an awareness of his loneliness and crushing consciousness erebus realized that it was alone and didn't want to be anymore so it gave birth to two sons architect the creator of everything and chaos the destroyer of everything architect had great plans he was ambitious and wanted to create many things he set out planning furiously he planned planets stars galaxies supernovas asteroids meteors black holes but his highest dream was creating life and for this he realized he not only needed the blessings of his creator but also the help of his own family he set out to breathe life into his children whom he shaped from dust and cosmic matter and brought to life with divinity his first child was life a god of survival fight and indomitable spirit of living his second child was thought the goddess of ideas innovation and higher thinking he birthed many more gods and along with his children he made numerous plans to create life and expand the universe but don't you realize they couldn't make it far in creating the universe why chaos who lurked in the dark recesses of the universe destroyed everything all the plants were brought to dust with chaos uncontrollable wrath for the longest time chaos who was still young energetic became absolutely out of control destroyed planets rained asteroids and created dangerous explosions that reverberated all across the galaxy the gods were perplexed what could they do how could they divert chaos attention they assembled together and thought about it they called chaos for the meeting and created a mass of a planet that chaos could work on destroying this planet could bear the wrath of chaos while the other gods could continue creating the universe and life in it but chaos destroyed it in one single blow it kept on creating multiple planets and chaos destroyed them all with one fist while the gods focused their energies on the creation of life chaos grew more impatient and angrier with the shortage of planets to destroy now chaos was so bold with just using his hands his fist to rain destruction started investing his attention to creating a beautiful hammer that could help him destroy planets meteors asteroids supernovas 
black holes sooner. Suddenly there was silence, pin drop silence. Somewhere a light was shining. Chaos and the gods were all silent. They didn't know where this light was from. We all know about chaos. He slowly walked in the direction of the light and saw a huge, pure, bright, white Mars planet, which was shining in its ethereal, divine beauty. Chaos lifted the hammer. The planet broke into pieces. Chaos. <laughs> I have shown the gods my strength by destroying this seemingly beautiful planet in one go. Suddenly, the planet came back to life. Chaos lifted the hammer again. Hit it. The planet regenerated. Alas. Chaos and his hammer in all his strength could not destroy it. All he could do was break the surface and work its way inside endlessly. Holes after holes, craters after craters, chaos hammered away. For millions of years, chaos hammered at this planet, reducing its size, but never destroying it completely. This angered chaos a lot. But at the same time, the gods also created a brilliant civilization called Gaia. Gaia was the recipient of all the gods' hard work and blessings, of course, without the interference of chaos. While Gaia evolved beautifully, they suffered from one thing every night. The people of Gaia looked up to the dark sky, filled with stars, but no light. They prayed for something to illuminate them, to save them from the impenetrable darkness of the night. The hopelessness that it brought crushed them. Their fervent and desperate cries and prayers reached the heavens calling on to the gods again. Now the gods pondered on what could they do? But these prayers also reached the ears of one particular god, Chaos. For the longest time, Chaos realized his obsession with anger. He looked down at the cries of man and his heart welled up with sorrow and shame. While mankind was plunging in darkness and was crying out so painfully, I have been hammering at the moon. While the gods were creating light, I have been hammering at the moon. What do I do? Will I ever be forgiven for my anger and hate, for never doing anything for mankind, for being so absent? Will I ever be forgiven and be able to move forward? Thought replied, Uncle, the truth is, unless you let go, unless you forgive yourself, unless you forgive the situation, unless you realize that the situation is over, you cannot move forward. You are strong chaos. And forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. To forgive yourself requires a strong mental mind. You can forgive yourself and move on. But before you indulge in anything that would cause destruction, remember the effect of our actions is permanent, such as you can see with the planet. So be wise from henceforth. Erebus told the weeping chaos, 
dear son, I always say this, to err is human and to forgive is divine. You are a divinity. You can atone by giving life a final gift. The grieving chaos looked at the planet. He was hit with an idea. He hammered this planet into a size that would be favorable to light up the night sky for guidance and gifted it with an ethereal glow, ever so soft and beautiful, presenting mankind the beauty of a celestial body that lit up the night sky, bringing the message of hope, forgiveness, redemption, and finally peace. Chaos gifted them the moon. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Well, that was something different. You really, yeah. you, you told a myth. That was a myth. Yes? <laughs> but, uh, how, how did you compose that? I mean, both, so, huh? so I just, uh, so I usually read a lot of mythology. And uh, so this is Greek god called Erebus. And mm -hmm. so I just thought, okay, I, I picked up Erebus. And then uh, I also thought that, you know, maybe I can create something. So, so I just wanted to give uh, a twist in the end. So what is this new planet like? And, uh, you know, how I can keep uh, the, the listeners engaged till the end. So they will never know what is it. So I tried to find a relation between something like the hammer and the moon. So uh, this is like, uh, I just created it. Uh, it's like when I wrote this story, I had only two things in mind. So I started it. So I usually write a lot of articles, uh, a lot of stories. But then this was something like, I just thought about two objects and I tried to weave a story uh, around them. So so it was very simple. Look, I, uh, I had this toy hammer or something. Uh, and uh, then I thought, okay, moon. And this was night uh, when I was actually writing this. And the story, uh, it, it was night time when I was writing this. So I got a lot of ideas then. Uh, and that's how I created a connect between hammer and the moon. And of course, uh, mythology is something I like. So I uh, tried to frame a connection between Greek call called Erebus. And then I gave a name uh, for destroyer, that's chaos. And then I gave something for architect. And then uh, life, art. Uh, so, yeah, so moon was the surprise element because I wanted to keep uh, a surprise in the end. So, um, and, hmm. uh, and then I also wanted to infuse this story with a lot of uh, morals. So it's uh, people who are usually, um, people who uh, have this air of arrogance or people who uh, possess a lot of frustration, anger, they find it very difficult to humble themselves down uh, and it happens in the long run. So I wanted to give a realistic uh, touch to the story by uh, mentioning that, you know, yes, uh, when you are of that type and, you know, when you are the devil, you, it'll take some time for you uh, to become the hero again. So it's like, you know, from a devil, how do you transform yourself? And when you hear mm -hmm. the cries and when you hear people, so you, uh, chaos has been relentlessly trying to, you know, hammer the moon, but he was just able to, uh, you know, go into craters and craters and holes and holes, and he was not able to completely destroy it. And so, so this, this, uh, if from this aspect, you know, uh, I uh, can probably think that our, our anger, the frustration that we hold or the regret that we hold in our lives, mm. it cannot last for long because at one point I, at one point of time, we will realize that what we have done is a mistake or, you know, the frustration or the anger and the grudge that we have is unnecessary. And it's definitely not, um, it's spoiling our peace of mind and it's spoiling the peace of mind of others. So this, through a fiction, I've tried to convey all these values uh, and that's exactly how I came about it. So every part of the story has something to uh, learn uh, for all of us. Mm -hmm. so it's like uh, you... You don't remain a bad person till the end. At one point, life will teach you that, you know, the, the mistakes that you commit or, you know, the, the negative impact or the harmful impact of your actions on people uh, will uh, definitely bother you more than them, just like how it did for chaos. He, oh. yes. So he was not able to destroy. He wanted to be 
the 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 person who could destroy everything he wanted everything in his hands he wanted to uh, completely destroy everyone and everything so the this was uh, this is another lesson this is probably another lesson that you know another perspective uh, that we can uh, gather from uh, this particular story so so you yeah go ahead yeah so if you remain you don't remain a bad person for long until you realize that you know you being this way is going to do more harm to you uh, than others and it's also going to do more harm to the world as well mm-hmm. so so you so you personified a number of um uh, elements of nature and um uh and other things you you personified chaos right chaos was a yes. character uh was thought a character sorry who who were the other characters so chaos you... and then there was erebus he was the god uh, uh who created both he created architect and chaos okay. so uh, when i so i i had a doubt that you know some of some of you all might ask me why would a god create a destroyer so mm-hmm. yeah so that I again i wanted to yes yeah so i wanted to make it a little uh, i wanted to twist this a little because you don't life doesn't come in a but, life but who, just come with roses who, it's not a bit bed of roses but who were the other characters in addition to chaos chaos erebus then there was architect so uh-huh. and there was thought thought the god of higher thinking yeah the god of higher thinking ideas that's so imaginative to yeah. to think of thought a, as a character uh, yes, and life life is the god of uh, survival spirit in the uh-huh. spirit of living so. fantastic uh, padmini uh yeah. padmini did you want to say something uh, uh yes uh, thank you erika wonderful uh, annapurni it was really lovely uh, thank you. i'm just just trying to connect uh, with the uh, the way the last it's what the last scene of yours like uh, you said when he saw and he, his heart also melted or something like that yes. so in the um, bihar side and all the tribals you know they have a ritual the bihar that side part of bihar in mithila area they have a, they make a clays of uh, uh, they have a festivity when they have all the clays made and there are lots of festival celebrations and all one such they make chugla chugli wherein uh, they even like all you put, throw stones gears and all everything to that it's in a way you went out your anger yes yes yeah somewhere you have yes. to vent out your anger and that doesn't stay for long and you went out and this throw and yes. even abuse they use all the kinds of languages yes uh, it has become a or a period yeah, i was told that it has become a kind of a fun activity so it's yes. a, more of anger you want to dis, uh, you want to uh, where went out but it has become more of, of uh, fun so it's like what is an anger you don't know that's the best part what i could uh, think and when you were telling that i could relate that and it was yes. yeah yeah initially story. when i wrote the story uh, i just expected you know some i this was a thought i had in my mind so i expected some of you all to actually ask me why should a god create architect and i mean why should he create a, he create a creator and a destroyer so this was the thought the the uh, thing i had so i was just expecting some of you all to ask this question no i had so, to ask but then i thought maybe then you started that they thought the destroyer might have been a jealous of the architect but that never connected and i thought okay maybe this is just a different kind of story not necessarily yeah, yeah, yeah probably the, i i can create this with a different i can i can include that and the story line can you know go on a different uh, it can take a different trajectory altogether but then now uh, what i thought was uh, it's always like like light doesn't come with just roses so you should have roses and thorns and and the gods when the gods were not able to do anything they still you know uh, uh, try to cope with it so it's like the struggle in life is real and you do have difficulties but uh, those difficulties difficulties won't stay for long and uh, in the end you know people who have harmed you will still come towards you so this is a lot of goodness also in this and then yeah so, so who, personification who is your who is your ideal audience for this for this story and this storytelling so my ideal audience would be uh okay, this is a really difficult question to answer so well do you think of telling it to children or teenagers or adults like this teenagers and young 
adults i mean mm-hmm. teenagers and adults but definitely not kids because they might not uh, fathom uh, the mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the nuances of uh, the story so but yeah definitely adults like you and teenagers probably over 13 14 years great anyway i would say even that uh, kids also would because they are more interested in cosmic and other things and all their cartoons yes. are more harmful i think the story for kids yes yes definitely well i think uh, young people uh, would especially enjoy this type of story if they if they had read some greek mythology yes greek uh, mythology you know if people are only exposed to their own religion and their own culture they um they will be sometimes they will be very um in awe of that and they won't they they can they won't imagine creating some imaginative um uh, you know new mythology so i think to re- to really appreciate this story it, it the the young people really it's it's best if they have been exposed to mythology from a number of different cultures yes yes you're right uh, yeah in fact right. when i was uh, rehearsing the story i had uh, i had a lot of thoughts like about you know the question that you asked this story will suit what uh, kind of an audience so when i was rehearsing the story i was just thinking should i should i modify this line this way should i probably act this out should i probably lower my voice here should i probably add a <clears throat> add some some phonics <laughs> in between the lines and dialogues mm-hmm. so i had all these doubts So but then uh, since I had already attended a session of yours so I thought okay let me just stick to teens and young adults plus uh, the older adults for now. It was just fine the way it was. Good. Okay, uh, does anyone want to add anything or shall we go on? I just want to say one thing it was hmm. uh, extremely evident like how you were enjoying writing the story as well as telling that. It felt like it was your story. so which you were sharing so that's the only thing i want to share well you know i often like a, a very conversational um uh uh tone of storytelling but the way you told it fit the story you know you always have to use a style that fits the uh the story and uh what you did fit great okay uh Anaga are you ready Yes I am but I think uncle K he's been trying to say something from yeah. a very long time <laughs> Okay uh uh go ahead you got to turn your mic on Uh somehow your voice is not coming through No, not coming through yet. Mm, maybe uh maybe write it in the uh uh chat section. Kalyan, can you hear me? You can hear me, I think, right? Kalyan, yeah, but we but we can't hear you and your 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 mic is muted so why don't you unmute it but i i think there's some other difficulty also you okay it's unmuted why why don't you write your thought in the chat section we'll all take a look at the chat section and uh and we really should keep going so you write and we'll we'll catch up uh um so anaga let's let's begin um yes. so um yes please uh please introduce yourself and tell us where you're telling from and and please tell us a story sure will do uh, i'm anaga prasad and i'm a storyteller from bangalore india and uh, i'm going to tell you a story which is uh, written by o henry and when i spoke to eric about this he said don't narrate the story as o henry has written you personalize it and then narrate it so i have adapted it from o henry's uh, writing story and this is my own version of the o henry story a service of love 
Rangashankara, a theatre place in Bangalore, was beaming with artists, sculpture, sculptors, painters, musicians, dancers. And where were they? They were all near the canteen, eating the sabudana vada, sipping the coffee and tea after a performance. And as they were sitting there, the performer, a dancer, came down in her costume with her anklets on and she said, one coffee for me, please. And as she was sipping, her eyes locked to someone who was admiring her from behind a sculpture. She looked, he looked, and that's where another conversational journey began. They started talking, they started meeting, and it didn't take them more than three months to get into a wedlock. They got married in just three months and shifted into a small house in the terrace of BTM layout in Bangalore, which is overcrowded and very, very, very noisy. They would sit out every day with their cup of tea and listen to music in spite of all the pam pam and all the honks in the streets. They would go in to make breakfast, not because they love cooking, but it was their display of love and the kuchikuing that they could do with each other. And getting ready in that small apartment was pleasurable. Both of them would leave for their respective arts. Oh, I didn't tell you who they are, isn't it? Asha was a dancer. She had come from a very, very small village near Hubli. She was just 18 years old and she had come to learn Bharatanatyam from one of the renowned uh, teachers in Bangalore. And she wanted to pursue the art further. And who was a man, Prakash. He was a sculptor who had come to do his sculpting uh, education course in Chitrakala Parshad. And he was from a small village in Mangalore. And both of them, after they got ready, would head to their respective art classes and would come back to their love nest by the sunset. But this happiness did not last long. Like all stories, isn't it? But the reason for that was they ran out of their savings and their money. And of course, they could not go back to their parents because this was their decision, their life. They decided that they're going to do some jobs. You don't worry, Prakash. I shall start teaching dance and then you go attend your course and we will live happily. Of course not. You're not going to give up on your dance. I will do some job. And they continued to argue this way. Asha, in the meanwhile, registered and announced that she's going to take dance classes in the students' houses itself. She thought this would be a good idea to get students. She didn't tell Prakash. Three days, there were no students enrolled. And that's when she told Prakash that this is what I have done and there are no students. What do we do now? You go back to your teacher, learn dance, don't worry. I will take care, said Prakash. Next day evening, as Prakash entered after his classes, Hey, you know what? I got a student. She's a young girl, Nandu. They live in Malleshwaram, the old charm of Bangalore. Ah, the filter coffee, the jasmine flowers. It's beautiful there. And her mom is also a very nice lady. They have decided to pay me 1,500 rupees a week. Isn't that great? Huh, okay, fine. But I think I don't like the idea. You know what? I'll start selling milk or newspapers or go do that masonry job. I don't want you to leave dance classes. Say Prakash. Come on. When one loves one's art, no service is too hard. She hugged him hard and said this. She set out to her first day of class and as she came back, hey, you look so tired. What happened? Prakash asked, didn't you enjoy the class? I told you not to start teaching. Of course not. It was beautiful. It is just that the traffic and the noise, which has just tired me a little. And you know that girl Nandu, she is so, so, so dedicated. She wants to just pick up.
from where she left from the other teacher. And her mom, Jaya ma'am, she peeps, no interference at all from her. And she'll say, listen to Asha Akka, and she'll just walk away. I think I'm going to enjoy it thoroughly. Prakash just slumped into the only chair that they had, looking very sad. She went and sat on him, cuddled him and said, don't you worry, when one loves one's art, no service is too hard. And they went and retired for the night. This continued for a couple of days. And on the third day, as she came back, she saw that Prakash had kept some money on the table. Did you sell a sculpture? He said, yes. You remember that mother-child sculpture of mine which I had kept in the park? A man from Chettinad bought it. Wow, tell me more about it. I am so thrilled and I want to know. Well, he really liked my work. He's commissioned for four more sculptures, you know. Oh, that's really nice. But what's this on your shirt? Some kind of oil, oil paint. You know, I was painting the sculpture. That's it, nothing at all. And the following Friday, she got one and a half thousand and kept it on the table. And when they had so much money, she ran into the kitchen. She made kesari bath and she said, we have to celebrate this now that we both have started earning. And the following weekend, they ordered dinner from Swiggy or Zomato and they ate like king and queen. They enjoyed it. The next week again, Prakash got his money and she said, did you again sell a sculpture? He said, yeah, things are going good. Are you enjoying? Because I think you have to quit now. She said, no, teaching also is making me learn. I am actually polishing my Natuvangam skills, you know. And you know that small little girl? She's dancing so well. She can do Adavus in third speed now. She can do it that fast. And her mother comes and says, Aramandi, listen to Ashaka, and she makes her sit down. I think she'll be a beautiful dancer. I am enjoying. This went on for two weeks. The third week, Friday night, Prakash came early, had kept his money on the table, the only table that they had, and was waiting for Asha to come. He heard her footsteps, but they were not the usual cheerful ones. They were a little dragged. He waited. She opened the door and there was no smile on her face and her left arm was all bundled up. What happened, Asha? Come, come sit down. And he made her sit on that only chair that they had. What happened? Please tell me. Does it hurt? After the class, Nandu, that girl, she wanted me to have coffee in there garden. I told you, they have a huge house in, uh, in, I mean, in amidst the uh, coconut trees and mango trees. She dragged me and she was running. I tried to keep pace with her. Tapak, I fell down. And I hurt my hand. The Jaya ma'am got so nervous, she sent somebody down the road to get cotton and bandage and they bundled it up. Don't worry dear, it doesn't hurt so much. When did all this happen? Asked Prakash. Asha looked at that money and said, Did you sell one more sculpture? Who bought it? That man from Chetinad, you can ask him. Tell me more about it. Tell me what time did all this happen? Must be around 5 o'clock in the evening. He sat down, put his arm on her lap, looked up into her eyes and asked, Asha, what have you been up to in the last couple of weeks? Tell me. She braved herself, muttered a few words, Jaya ma'am, Nandu. But then her head went low and out came the truth and the tears. I couldn't get any pupils to teach. So I joined the packaging division in that Rajapa a garment factory and I've been in that packaging division and today around five o'clock a girl when she was stacking up all the packages one heavy package fell on my arm 
and that's what I've been doing. I hope you're not angry. It, it's not that I didn't want to tell you. I just want you to continue. See, could you have sold your sculptures if I had told you this? But you're so clever, my dear. No wonder I fell for you. How did you find out that I am not going and teaching dance? Elasha, I never, ever, ever suspected it till tonight. I have to confess, I haven't sold any sculpture. What? Then from where do you get all this money? Well, I have been working for the last couple of weeks in the generator room in the Rajappa garment factory. And today at five o'clock, someone came and told me that a girl has hurt her hand and my generator room has the first aid for the whole factory. And I sent up the cotton and I could make that out seeing the slip which has come out of the bandage which said Rajappa. And that's when I asked you. Both of them just hugged each other. And he said, my seller, your Jaya Ma'am and Nandu are all creations of our art, isn't it? But we can't call this art dance or sculpting. When one loves one art, he, can, he started, she went, placed her hand on his lips and said, just when one loves. Thank you. So this is my adaptation from that story. Yes, it was very beautiful. Thank you, Eric. Anaga, I remember uh, having this story as part of a 10th standard or 9th standard prose. Oh, uh, and yeah. I still remember how, uh, I mean, at that age itself, the impact the story had. And now I was wondering when you started Bangalore and all, where is she going to lead this to? What, uh, what they are, I mean, what will they be doing? That suspense was, you know, that kept, I mean, it, you had us hooked till the end. And such a beautiful story, neatly adapted. Thanks Thank for that. You. Thank you, Amu. Very glad, Anaga. Uh, one thing is I'm so happy that uh, the place you choose was Hubli, from where I belong. I'm oh, okay. <laughs> A lot of dances are from Hubli, Belgaum, Dharwad side. So I thought, so, okay, I'm going to the Sabudana that reminded me I should soak for tomorrow, I should soak tonight. Thank you for that also remind, reminding me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, Anaga. You really beautifully narrated the story. I love the way you describe, you know, the things, the love. And uh, I too am from uh, Hubli Dharwad. Oh. So, and I love the Sabudana Vada. So everything was so familiar to me. So I really you. felt nice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pratima. Thank you. <laughs> so, Anaga, do you do a lot of storytelling? Yes, Eric, I do. I do both for adults and uh, for children. And I'm a part of uh, a group called Katha Crafters. So we are four, four storytellers together and we do a lot of shows together, both for mm -hmm. adults and uh, mm -hmm. young children. And you're very, uh, you're very good at looking into the camera. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the last one year of pandemic has made us do that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the way you were telling it, it was just riveting. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you. And thank you so much for making me adapt it. Otherwise, my plan was to just tell it like how O. Henry has written it. So um, I think adapting it was, it, I felt very nice. I, I actually could own the story. Mm. So... Yeah, that I think it's very nice. It's very important when we tell a story that was written by somebody else. Uh, it's very important to really uh, digest it and uh, and make it one's own, both in terms of the words that we use and and maybe changing uh, you know details. Uh, but uh, you you did, you did a great job of um, uh, you know uh, adapting it to to your environment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Anaga, I loved your narration. It was so clear, so sequenced, so in order. And it, it, it was almost as if I was reading a book. It was so good, yes. And the description of the emotions of the characters, I loved that too. Thank you. This is O. Henry's Gift of the Magi, right? No, no, this is O. No. Henry's Service of Love. Okay. It's it's a little similar to the gift of magi yeah. okay. in the, in that that's his most famous story okay. in which there's a couple who they want to give each other's gifts for for Christmas and um, uh, she cuts her hair to give him uh, to give him yeah and he and he sells his watch to buy her combs for her hair so so each one has given a gift that is not useful to the other because they have both sacrificed the object that was most valuable to them. But again, like in this story, they don't care. They're just happy with each other. Yeah. So that, that, that story was there in my mind. But then I was like, almost everyone, everyone knows the story. And the service of love, though it was on the same lines, uh, it kind of really touched me because uh, uh, it's, it, that story, the couple are a little older. In this, they're all very young. So uh, how for love, uh, the young people also sacrifice and they want to make the relationship grow. So that is what really touched me in this story. It was really beautiful, Anagha. And uh, more your narration, we could visualize every sequence. So, you know, Vasuki was telling you, you could read, this was like reading a book, more than reading, this visualizing, you know, you narrated it so well. You could actually visualize every sequence in our mind. Very nice, very beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, shall we go on? Uh, and before we do, uh, Kalyan, uh, thank you for posting a, a, a message in the chat section. Kalyan wrote about the previous story, the, uh, the, the myth of the moon. Um, he wrote, chaos in the story reminds me of Loki, not from Norse mythology, but from the Marvel Universe, is that a comic book series, like superheroes? It's, uh, yeah. the... it's a movie series. It's a movie ah. series, actually, yes. Okay. And there was yeah. a recent TV show which came up a couple of months ago. They had a whole series on Loki, in which yeah. the whole thing was about forgiveness and redemption. Whereas in the movies, he was the bad guy. He, he did everything wrong. <laughs> yes, she wrote that uh, Loki, after destroying everything in the cinematic universe, uh, in the latest TV season, Loki was, uh, the, the, it was all about forgiveness and redemption. And you were talking about children, right? I thought mm. talking about Loki might be easier to get them involved because most of them are MCU fans. Sure, mm. sure. Yeah, I think I should include, I will include that and take that. Mm. Okay. Uh, shall we go on now to... Um, Ambuja. Ambuja, are you ready? Yes. Okay, Ambuja, please um, introduce yourself and uh, tell us where you're telling from and please tell us a story. Thanks so much, Eric, for this end attempt of giving me yet another opportunity to share a story. And today something is very different for me and what is the difference? I will tell at the end of the story. Mahabharata, one of the two great epics of India. Krishna was the backbone of Mahabharata. Who was this Krishna? He was considered as the incarnation of Mahavishnu, the god of protection. Now, Krishna gave two kinds of teachings to mankind. One, the Bhagavad Gita, which literally trans, uh, translates into the song of the God. And the second one is the Uddhava Gita. Now, what is this Uddhava Gita? Once Mahabharata, everything was over, it was time for Krishna to leave his human form and go back to his heavenly place. And that's when Uddhava, his friend and counselor, comes to him and he says, Krishna... I have so many questions in my mind. I don't understand why things happen the way they happen in Mahabharata. And I'm also sure it's not only me. 
many people who read mahabharata who listen to mahabharata will have the same questions why don't you answer these questions krishna smiled and he said thank you uddhava i am glad that you asked me and that's when the conversations the open conversations between uddhava and krishna began and uddhava gita was born and here i am to share a small snippet of this conversation and for the benefit of those who have not uh, read the story of mahabharata let me share that snippet of that story alone that relates to that conversation and before i continue may i request you to mute yourself because i am able to hear lots of other sounds yeah thank you thank you so much so this snippet of uh, the this snippet of the conversation which i am going to share to understand that snippet let me share that portion of mahabharata and then go into the conversation na 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 once upon a time the kingdom of hastinapura was ruled by the king dhritarashtra he had 100 sons called the kauravas and dhritarashtra's deceased brother pandu had five sons called pandavas these five sons were married to one woman why did they why did they marry one single woman that's a story for a different day now all these pandavas excelled in so many many things and as expected the kauravas had nothing but anger wrath jealousy towards this pandavas all they wanted was to remove all the royal rights from them and just banish them off to the forest but how to do that was the question and that's when their maternal uncle shakuni came to their rescue na 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 my dear children let me tell you you cannot win them by might you cannot win them by intelligence the only thing you can do is to trick them trick is the only thing that will defeat them okay uncle but how leave that to me i have this pair of dice made from the spinal cord the bone of my father the number i think here will be shown on the stars call them for a gambling match and i will rip them of all the things that they have and the kauravas somehow lured the pandavas for the match the eldest brother yudhishthira came to the court and the match started between yudhishthira and shakuni tantra din tantra dom tantra na the match started whatever shakuni thought the number in his head was that that was shown on the dice yudhishthira was not aware of that he thought maybe this time maybe next round maybe next round the luck will be in my favor round after round he kept on losing and he started losing all his material wealth and he reached a state where nothing was left with him and that's when shakuni said hey yudhishthira why do you worry your four brothers you call them as your valuable assets bet them maybe luck might change in your favor why not thought you this trap and he started betting his brothers one after the other tam tarana tam tarana nin tarana and lost all of them now he had nothing no one left or that's what he thought when shakuni again intervened hey this trap how about that beautiful wife of yours the lucky charm better maybe her luck may change your fate if you thought the straw was agitated you are wrong the straw thought why not yes she is the goddess of prosperity of our family maybe her luck would help us let me bet and so she bet his own wife tam targida ni targida tom targida nam and he lost his wife to that in no what to do wow 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 uncle beautiful uncle now all these pandavas are as slaves remove all your royal clothes remove all your royal identities and wear the clothes of slaves ordered duryodhana one of the kauravas 
He looked at his brother Duchadana and said, Go bring that wife of theirs here. Duchadana went to Draupadi's chamber, pulled her, holding her hair, hair, dragged her to the courtroom and just pushed her in front of everyone. There stood Draupadi, daughter of a king, wife of five kings and sister of Krishna, with her hair opened and disheveled and clothes not even dressed properly, one face full of confusion, helplessness, no clue what was happening around. If you thought that was bad, the worst was yet to come. And Duryodhana ordered his brother, hey the Chadana, strip her, remove her clothes. Oh no, this can't happen, was Draupadi's reaction. She started to shake with fear. She ran to her husband and said, see, did you hear what they said? This can't happen to me, right? I'm sure nothing will happen to me when you fire off your around and think of the marital woes and, and, and all those promises that you made. I'm sure nothing will happen to me, right? But there was no response. She moved to the learned men, the sages, the elders who were seated in the courtroom. I'm sure when I entered this kingdom, what did you all say? You said, you'll take care of me like your daughter. And, and you know what is right and what's not right. Uh, 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 just think, just think, what will the world say? None of them will forget this. Please do something. But there was no response. And then she looked at all the people openly and she cried. It's like thousands and thousands of worms eating me alive. Can't you feel the pain? Please do something. <laughs> Draupati, none of them are going to help you because all of you are our slaves. And that was Duryodhana. And he didn't stop with that. You have an option. Come, sit on my thigh. Embrace me and be my mistress. And I can save you. She, how dare you talk like that? And that of yours, Duryodhana, mark my words, your death lies there. And that was the Rabbi. But her anger was immediately replaced with fear when she realized Duchadana had already caught hold of the tip of her sari. And he started pulling her sari and her hands impulsively went and covered herself. No, this can't happen to me. Help, help, who's there to help? And that's when she realized there was only one person who could help her. And that's when she opened her hands, stretched them up and shouted, Abhayam Krishna, Abhayam, help me Krishna, please. And immediately she became oblivious to what was happening around. It was as though she was in a trance. Duchadana continued pulling the dress. But what was that? The more he pulled the sari, the sari kept on coming. It seemed like there was no end to that sari at all. Hours and hours of pulling and Duchadana was exhausted. When Draupadi opened her eyes, she saw a pile of clothes in front of her. She understood who and why she was helped. Let me stop the story here and let us go back to the conversation between Uddhava and Krishna. Uddhava asked Krishna, Krishna, tell me, who is a true friend? Well, Uddhava, a friend who, a friend in me, like, you know, whoever goes to help his friend, even when the help is not required, or even when the friend doesn't call you, he is a true friend. In that case, Krishna, how can you call yourself as a true friend of the Pandavas? Shouldn't you have stopped Yudhishthira when he accepted for that match? Okay, you just let him play the match. That's fine. But when he started to play, you, the omnipresent, the omnipotent, you could have helped him win, right? Why didn't you do that? How can you call yourself a true friend? Krishna smiled and said, let me tell you, Uddhava, Duryodhana had a conscience. He knew that he cannot win the match if he played. That's why he sent Shakuni on his behalf. But what did Yudhishthira do? Should he have asked me to play on his behalf? If I had played against Shakuni, just think, who would have won the match? But you know what Yudhishthira thought? He thought, oh no, Krishna shouldn't know that. What I'm doing is not right. And Krishna should never, never come to know about this. Otherwise, he'll think bad of me. 
And that's what he thought. And how can I go and help him when he doesn't want me there? But in spite of that, the true friend in me made me wait near the door. I was waiting for one of the Pandavas to call me so that I can immediately go and help them. But none of them called me. And only when Draupadi called, I, I couldn't wait anymore to go and help. Okay, Krishna, I'm not fully convinced. But okay, fine. With Yudhishtra, at least I can accept. But with Draupadi, your own sister, just think, she didn't hide anything from you. Why did you let her go through so much of humiliation? You could have stepped in right at the, in the beginning and you could have helped her, right? Why didn't you do that? Well, Uddhava, for me to reach out to someone, I shouldn't have any hindrance. I shouldn't have any block between me and that person. I tried, tried to help her the first time. She went to her husband's and her husband's came in between me and her. And the second time, she went to all the elders and the sages in that room and they came in between both of us. And the third time, the remaining people, they came in between both of us. And the fourth time, she tried to protect herself and she herself came in between both of us. I was dying to help her, but she was not letting me. And only when she opened her hands and she totally surrendered, that's when... I was able to reach out to her and help her. But Uddhava replied, Fine Krishna, but still I am not convinced. Why do you let people sin at all? Why don't you stop people doing any sins? Why do you let them do something bad and then all these problems? Krishna replied, Exactly Uddhava. You said, I am the omnipotent, omnipresent, fine. But how many of you realize that? Yudhishthira knew that he was present everywhere. In spite of that, he thought that I should not know what he was doing. When you are fully aware that I am near you, that I will be there to support you whatsoever might happen. Trust me, I am there for you. But when you want to do something without me not knowing, when you want to hide something from me, tell me, how can I help you? Was Uddhava convinced? We have no clue. Are we convinced? That depends on whether we can feel his presence by our sight or not. Before I end, like, like any other scriptures, all these scriptures are so very vast with so many versions. And if there was any mistake in the version which I shared, please do bear with me and please do let me know the mistake. I'll be glad to correct. And second thing, I was introduced to storytelling by Eric. And Eric had provided so many, many platforms, not only to me, to hundreds of people around. A big thanks to Eric for that. And the last thing, something that I tried new today, for most of you here, you know, there are two integral elements for my story. Whatever story I tell, I have, I, there, there should be two things in my story. Otherwise, I don't feel the story is complete. One is music or rhythm. And second thing is humor. And this is the first story in my whole storytelling life, which I have tried without a little bit of humor in it. So thanks so much. And it did come out beautifully. So it is amazing to see you come out of the comfort zone of not using humor. And yet, none of us knew that you were out of your comfort zone. So kudos to you. And it was beautiful, Ambu. Just Thank like you. Always, all the time. Excellent, Ambu. Very nice. Superbly told. And one more aspect is uh, when we completely surrender, that's when God comes right that is there and one more is our conscience itself is our god so that also like you know yudhishthira had the thing he was doing wrong and krishna shouldn't find out so it's the moment you listen to your conscience and go on the right path i think that is also as good as listening to god so our conscience is our first god definitely true. very true. Really nice actually one. actually thanks to eric for the theme you know the open conversation that title actually made me choose this uh, um, story. Otherwise, I would have got the uh, guts to choose. In our Puranas, there are so many wonderful conversations like this. It's very yes. nice. It really brought along. Really nice. Well, what really made the uh, 
the storytelling for me was the contrast between the different um, tones of voice. Uh, uh, through much of the, of the telling, uh, uh, you were playing a character who was very emotional and speaking fast and uh, a relatively high pitch, but uh, there were a number of moments where you stopped and changed the pace. The, the first one that really, really jumped out at me was um, when the, that man said, um, none of those people are going to help you because they are all my slaves. That was such a radical different tone and speed from the from the what came before it, it was just breathtaking. I'm Thank sure everyone you. everyone remembers yes. that moment, right? Yes, amazing. none of those people are going to help you. That really uh, it stopped the story cold, but of course it the story continued, but it 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 changed the uh, it changed the nature of the whole thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My, my favorite image from the story was actually the sari being unwound and unwound and unwound. And that signaled to me that this, now the story is entered into another realm. And we don't know what's going to really happen next. Even if they say, you have no friends, they won't help you. Who knows what will happen next? So thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's a very, very big uh, story. La, so it needs one full series of Eric's Monday meetings to complete the whole Mahamartha. <laughs> I would suggest like, if you are interested, I mean, go ahead and read it. Because one thing I would like to share about Mahabharata, it is said that whatever is found around the world, good or bad, um, accepted relationships, non-accepted relationships or happiness, miseries, everything can be found in Mahabharata. And what is not there in Mahabharata, you cannot find it anywhere is what as being said. So that that is the vastness of that effect. Ammo, as a yes, person who has listened a lot to your humorous storytelling, this is vastly impressive. Now we know we have to ask you to tell stories like these two. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed this and the voice modulation expression, that habit you have of breaking out into song to show the transition from one scene to another and including a little bit of Bharatanatyam, uh, uh, the, those uh, uh, words that we use to show the speed with which things are done. It was great. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, it was a conscious effort not to bring in humor anywhere, to be very frank. So uh, it was a total new try for me. Glad no, the emotions of Draupadi were excellent. The way you portrayed the emotions of Draupadi suffering was really nice. Excellent. Thank you, you Ambujavali. Mm -hmm. It was a lovely and a lively story. You said it so, like you narrated it uh, in such a lively manner that we all could visualize what was going on in uh, the court of uh, the Kauravas and uh, the cruelty of uh, Duryodhan. So I'm sure that the ones who have not read Mahabharata, they could easily visualize what's happening, who is on the uh, bad side and who is on the good side. And uh, it was a lovely uh, scene that you quoted that Krishna was at the doorstep of uh, the chamber. So, uh, and it was just a matter of calling him. Yes. With all your heart. So that's so true. Krishna is my favorite God. And I feel that uh, um, it's very auspicious. Wherever uh, Krishna is there, so the things uh, go very smoothly. That's what I believe. So today is my storytelling and hopefully Krishna <laughs> motivates me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. I've never heard you tell and I don't, I've never read the Mahabharata. I don't even know how to say it. But you are... Uh... Oh, you're, David, you're, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm go sorry. ahead. Uh, you, you set it up so well, what I was going to see and the difference between that and the commentary that I was never lost. So first I thought I was in good hands. And then when you launched into song, 
but for every segment, it was like a, a new scene in a new movie. So you kept me going, kept me, and I, someone had said, oh, this, she's just experiment, experimenting with humor for the first time. I would have thought, no, she's, she's a pro. She's doing it all the time. So thank you so much. It was so well done. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Ah, Ambuja, Ambuja, this Thank is you. a very difficult story, I tell you. And uh, Mahakavi Bharadiyar has taken this Panjali Sapatam. Panjali is Trapati. And uh, it's very difficult to tell, narrate this incident in 10 minutes. It's really difficult. Probably that made you to tell very faster. But I have heard Maybe. this story thousands of times. And uh, never I heard this story in such a 10 minutes which is such a fastness to tell in this episode because this is very difficult to describe in 10 minutes, I'm telling you, because so many characters, probably uh, you have no time to introduce those characters because the focus is on uh, Panjali, uh, that is Draupadi. And yes. uh, if I remember correct, Pan Panjali never cried. She was very okay. courageous and faced the situation and questioned whoever was present in that uh, court, uh, mm -hmm. those elders and everything. Uh, that only I, uh, you probably you were uh, you were singing and everything is managed it. And I felt that you mentioned as if she was crying. Uh, did yes. you? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I get that. No, uh, that is the only thing I would like to comment. Panjali never cried. I tell you, if I understand. Actually, that. yeah, yeah. Yes. No, what you say is perfectly right. Lady. And I, yes, she and was a brave lady, was similar really to Sita. Sorry, yes. Are you saying something? Yeah, yeah, what you say is perfectly correct. Panjali, yes. Sita, both of them, there are two versions. One is like, they, both of them were very brave characters. Yes. On the other side, it's like, so it's like, it's always, that. that is why, you know, I was I was a little confused whether to take this version of Panjali or that version of Panjali. Yeah, if you I read, totally agree to your points. Yeah, if you read Mahakavi Bharadiya, who wrote this Panjali Sabadam, I, I, I read this several times, and she was such a courageous lady, and she was totally, totally disappointed with her husbands. And she was totally responsible. She, she challenges everyone bravely. And, uh, and uh, ultimately, of course, uh, Krishna says that and whatever explanation is so philosophical and it's really difficult for you to explain in 10 minutes. I agree with it. Right. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank, Thank you, sir. But, Thank but you. Okay. Ambuja, your touch is that, na, 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 all those musical notes. <laughs> <laughs> and everything is yeah, I could skip the humor part, but I couldn't skip the music part because that only pulls me into the story. Otherwise, I kind of feel lost. No, without okay. that, you cannot tell the story. I know that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, we, you, we need to, uh, to proceed. Yeah. But thank you very much, Ambuja. And um, now, uh, Norman, can you hear me? Uh, you've got to turn your mic on. Yes, I can hear you. And are you in Canada or... Where, where are you? Uh, okay, I am in Canada, but since we are about 4,000 miles across, um, I am in the eastern section of Canada, mm -hmm. in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, wonderful, and, um, wonderful. Okay, uh, please uh, introduce yourself and um, okay. again, tell us tell where you're, where you're telling from and, and please tell us a story. Okay, thank you, Eric, and thank you for inviting me. I've been, I've, I've had that, that terrible problem of hearing the stories and being reminded of other stories that somehow want to crowd their way in. But this is a story that, actually, there's two parts to it. The first part is a bit on the short side, and the second one as well. This story is for the listener, what I call the hidden listener. Within uh, stories, we, we talk about performance and the teller, but there's other person is the listener. And that is this story, or the two stories are dedicated to. Once a long time ago, in the land of the uh, Middle East, there was a king. There was a king who had a beautiful daughter who grew up to be wise and accomplished and time for her to get married. 
and that's the custom of the day, a suitor, a proper suitor, had been arranged for her. And she was called to the king, and the advisors were all around. And, oh, dear father, she said, what is this wonderful occasion? He said, it's time for you to get married. Yes, father, I know it is. Well, we have found a suitable husband for you, a young prince in a neighboring kingdom who is fine and handsome and, and clever as you are. It will be a fine match. At these words, the princess turned pale. She began to crumble and she fell down in a heap on the floor. And they all rushed around her and they tried to wake her up. They threw water on her, but she remained, she remained unconscious. They took her to her uh, chambers. They laid her upon the bed. And there she lay. Beautiful, pale, and unconscious. Of course, they called for the doctors. Doctors came from near. And they said, your daughter is, they examined her. They, they looked at her uh, uh, eyes, they took her pulse. They, they checked all the things that the doctor did in those days. And they came to a conclusion that your daughter is in love. Well, who is her lover? Who is the one that she loves? And they said, well, we do not know that. But I mean, we do know this that unless the uh, young woman's lover is brought into her presence, she will die. She will not wake up. Now, word went out through the kingdom that whoever was the lover of the princess should come forward. But nobody came forward. Nobody at all. It's obvious that the whoever it was was, was too much of a, of a coward to step forward. Another doctor came and he said, well, your daughter has just one week to live. And then he left and the king resigned himself to the to the coming death of his daughter. And he sat beside her bed watching her. When there came word of a of another doctor a fakir, a Sufi doctor who had come to the palace and the king, he was brought to the king and the king asked him, who are you and what are you here for? He says, well, I'm here to help your daughter. I can find the lover that you who will not step forward. But my daughter will not speak. We will see, said the uh, Sufi uh, doctor. Bring me to her. And they brought her, uh, him to her. I need to um, uh, mute again. Okay. We need to. So he sat beside the bed. He did the other things that the other doctors did. He examined her. He put his uh, finger on her neck for a pulse. And then he sat beside the bed and he called for a scribe. And then he took her by the wrist. And he holding her by the wrist, he leaned over and he began to whisper into her ear. They couldn't make out what he was saying. But after a time, he turned around and said something to the scribe who wrote it down. Once again, the Sufi doctor turned, held her wrist, whispered into her ear. And after a time, he stopped. And the scribe wrote something else down. And then the third time, and it was a long time that he spoke into her ear, but finally he stopped, whispered to, uh, to the scribe, and then the scribe, he said, speak to the king what you have written down. And the scribe said, uh, your daughter, is, the lover of your daughter is a goldsmith. He lives in the city of Bokhara, and his name is Ahmed the goldsmith. Well, the king was amazed. He sent uh, messengers to the city of Bokhara, and there in the street of goldsmiths, there indeed was the uh, goldsmith by that name. And when he was confronted by the messengers of the king, he confessed everything. And they took him back to the king, 
and they took him to the chamber of the princess who was still in a deep, deep, death-like sleep. But at the sound of his voice, she opened her eyes and she smiled. And they brought her food and she began to sip the soup and soon she was much better. And so the two, the king saw that love, love will have its own way. The two were married and they had lived in happiness and joy and they had many children and may their happiness be your happiness and our happiness as well. Now, afterwards, the king had called the Sufi and he said, explain yourself. My daughter said nothing while you were examining her. She said nothing. Oh, she was very, she, was, she said a lot, said the Sufi. She told me everything I needed to know. When I whispered into her ear, I whispered lists of names and I was holding her wrist and her heartbeat, which was low and steady, suddenly began to beat faster when I said Ahmed. And so it was the same when I said Goldsmith and the city of Bakara, Bokara. And that is how your daughter told me who she, her lover was, where he was, and his occupation. The king sent away the Sufi with suitable gifts. And that is the story of the princess, I mean, of the lover and the dying princess. Thank you. Now, stories are, they say they're just a fairy tale. But this wee short story, well, I can witness it myself. I was at a hospital for program for children and uh, it was an outdoor program. And I was talking to one of the people who worked inside the hospital, her name was Jean. And she told me about the time when she was 10 years old and she was dying from polio. Her, nobody knew how to uh, take, to um, revive a child when they were that deep in uh, the disease. And so they were waiting for her to die. And they sat beside her bedside and it's pretty boring just sitting there doing nothing, waiting for the breath of the child to cease. So one of them, whatever he, who he or she was, picked up a book and began to read it. But they hadn't finished the book when the next person came along. Person closed the book went away and the second person sat down to wait for that last breath. When suddenly they heard, you didn't finish the story. I want to hear the rest of the story. And as Jean told me, she made a full recovery. She came back from the edge of itself because she had to know what the rest of the story is. And so we never know who's hearing us, who's listening to us, even if it seems they're far away from this world, there is something within the spirit that is listening to the story. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. And I must admit that is the most nervous I have ever been telling a story for a while. My apologies. Hmm. <laughs> Mm, Norm? Yes? So there's a lot of uh, truthfulness and simplicity in your storytelling. I loved it. You know, it's oh, so elegantly simple, so beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank okay. you. It, the, felt um... like, uh, it felt like actually sitting around the fireplace and uh, listening to, you know, I mean, you know, the kind of weather around and uh, listening to stories. So that's the feel we got. Well, at that place, I got to tell stories around a fire a lot because it was outdoors. And, um, and I once had an audience of four teenagers who were all in induced comas. 
and um i did know what story to choose i forget what story i told but i was told afterwards that the four teenagers liked the story and how did they know why their heartbeats mm. moved faster when i was telling the story so mm. you know um one of the things that prompted me to choose those two stories is that i believe that all stories are true they say they're fairy tales or folk tales, and they never really happen. But as the Mahabharata says, there's so much truth in it with, within those stories. We just have to be ready to hear it. And the hidden listener I speak about is the storyteller themselves. We have to hear our own stories. Noam? You brought back uh, the pleasure of me listening to my grandfather as a child. This was the simplest, the most truthful story I have heard in a while. I liked it. Thank you. So Thank, much. You. Thank you. I do try. Well, you see, I do try for that simplicity, the simplicity yes. and clarity of a of a parable. And yes. I was feeling intimidated because um the other storytellers are they're full of details etc they'll never listen to my story and uh, i must admit i i'm gonna have to work on self-confidence maybe i should call upon krishna for that <laughs> no that uh, that's uh you know uh, understatement of yourself and it's been a pleasure a true pleasure listening to you it was as if i was sitting my beside my grandfather on the charpoy legs dangling and listening to a story just for the pleasure of listening to it. And oh, thank you. just for the pleasure of enjoying a good story. Thanks. Thank you. You, thank you know, simplicity is the most complex thing. Mm -hmm. As a science practitioner, that's what we have taught. Simplicity is the most mm -hmm. complex thing to come by. And it, it, it's, it was great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, and um, it's a, a wonderful thing that a story can be told halfway around the her world and be heard in so many places. That And um, it, the story reaches. And that's what I'm very uh, I'm glad of what Eric has been doing over the last year and a bit is that the stories have reached out across the world through a medium of the internet, et cetera. And um, I've, I haven't heard enough stories, um, but I certainly, Eric, I'm going to be coming to listen to more, to more of them. And um, yeah, that's about it. Well, you know, it's this, uh, this terrible, horrible pandemic, which uh, has had one good side effect which is that it has uh, increased the, uh, the amount of video conference communication many, 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 many times over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I know it's, uh, it's a cliche and it's superficial, but, um, you know, I hear little things about uh, the, the development of global consciousness and uh, global community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and well, you mentioned consciousness, and um, the the thing about Jean is this: her story happened in the 1950s when she was 10 years old, and people thought that that people in uh, in a coma were not interacting with the outside world. Mm. They just in like in her case, she was in the thing called paralytic shock which meant that the body was slowly shutting down mm. and there was no way no way in the world that we could reach into that child's mm. mind and bring her back mm. so they just waited for her to die and somehow the storyteller took a story to the edge of life and death itself mm. and she had to come back because what was the rest of the story you know mm -hmm. and that uh, that talking to gene has taught me that stories and it's again a cliche we talk about stories being powerful and meaningful and they are 
but sometimes we don't know how powerful they are. Even if a story is unfinished, curiosity then takes over and it calls up and calls back even the child who is sitting at the border of death itself to come and hear the rest of the story. You know, I love the expression, um, the right story will do its work on you. Because it gets you to thinking, mm -hmm. well, okay, what, what work needs to be done on me? Yes. Uh, <laughs> and oh, then it starts, it starts getting done. Okay, let's, uh, let's okay. go on. And I apologize about the sound now and then. Uh, I see in the participant section, I have an option for mute all upon entry. So I'm going to click that now. And then maybe when people join, uh, it will mute them automatically. Let's see what happens. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, they can, people can unmute themselves, but they're being muted now upon entry. Uh, very good. Okay, Kushbu, are you ready? You yes, are ready. Eric, Wonderful. You? Yes. Uh, Okay, please um, introduce yourself. Tell us where you're, you're telling from and please tell us a story. I am Kushbu, I'm from Jaipur, Rajasthan. And here I go. One and a half year ago, one Saturday morning, I received a ping sound on my phone. I looked at it. There was a mail from IIM in the bus CIA, go. Oh, this must be a spam or a promotional message. Anyways, check it. The title was Selection for Cohort 3. And I was selected for the Women Entrepreneurship Program by IM Ahmedabad, CIA, Co. Initially, I didn't believe it. I thought, this is not for me. This must be a spam again. Then I thought, Kushbu, apply your common sense. I looked into the CC. The mail was marked to the interviewer who took my interview, the most difficult interview. Nine years ago, when I was working in a corporate, I knew what were interviews all about. But I left it nine years ago and giving interviews to for a course was completely out of question, but still I did it. I don't know what I was thinking about as I read the mail. Congratulations, Kushbu. We are glad to inform you that you are selected for the IIM Entrepreneurship Program, Women Entrepreneurship Program for Rajasthan Women Entrepreneurs only, supported by CII Co, GIG, Germany, Haranau Community, and backed up by Startup Oasis, Rajasthan. Please be there on Monday with the presentation whereby you have to tell about yourself. You have to introduce your business and the PPT is attached here with, please present all the details in the format. I told myself, business, me, presentation, that I left it long time ago, I can't do it. And I'm actually selected for I am Ahmedabad Entrepreneurship Program from which angle I am an entrepreneur. I'm a storyteller. I've been telling stories for five years to little children, training them in the art and craft of storytelling. I am not an entrepreneur. What came to my mind that I applied for this program? What I was thinking? I don't think so, I can do it. This is not for me. It is by I am Ahmedabad. I am nowhere capable for handling this program. And look at the piece of information that it is asking for. Logo, I don't have any. Business is registered or not registered? No. What is your entity all about? What is entity? What is a business entity? I don't know. What is the stage of business? Incubation, acceleration, stagnant? What does this weird words mean? What was your sales figure last year? I know none. I don't have any data. I used to go deliver story, take money, come back, spend that money or keep it in the wallet. I don't have any data. You have to be there. 
I was completely nervous. With these thoughts that I am not good enough and I can't do this program, I went into the washroom. I freshened up, washed my face, and looked myself at the mirror. And the girl in the mirror told me, are you serious? Are you seriously going to let go that opportunity? Boss, it's IIM Ahmedabad. I am not worth I am not an IIM Ahmedabad material. What is an IIM Ahmedabad? It is the premier business institute of the country. Okay, I just have ideas. I don't have any business plan and maths and numbers. And I was a complete 40% scorer in class 10. I can't do it. Khushbu, relax. Look back. Look back from where you started. Do you remember that day when you got your first job? Yes, so what? Everybody gets a first job. Do you think you were qualified for job? No. So then why did you get the job? Probably they liked my communication skills. <sighs> when you joined the job, did you have the skill set? Did you even know MS Word, Excel, and how to operate softwares? No, you learned it, right? Yes, I did, but I was young. I was really young at that point of time. So what, Khushbu? You had the passion. You had the drive. You have put in your heart and soul in that job, and that's what made you the HR head in a, within a span of three years. With 50,000 salary per month, what's the big deal in that? You know, I am Ahmedabad, pass out, get salaries in crores. I am nowhere. And I find in three months, if I'm getting a package of six lakhs per annum, what's the big deal about it? You have a terrible problem. You always get a good opportunity and you tell yourself that you're not good enough. Let me take you to another event, Khushbu. Remember when you were pregnant? Yes, the most beautiful phase of my life. Did you know anything about storytelling or storytellers? No. Then how did you become a storyteller? I learned it. It was on the job. And my, the passion to tell stories to my son helped me to grow what I am today. Exactly, Kushbu. And today you have trained more than 500 children. Schools call you for presentations. Schools call you for telling stories. So what makes you think that you are not good enough? You have been selected out of the 1,000 applicants for this program. And you are one of the 270 participants who are selected. They must have seen you. Do you think the selectors are stupid? No, but I'm not confident about myself. That's a pattern in you. You always do this. Go back to your childhood memories and look for those moments where you have been constantly told that you are not good enough and you have watched those stories for yourself. Yes, I know, but do you think I can do it? Yes, Kushbu, you can do it. You have been doing it at every phase of life. Don't you know it? When your father passed away, when your mother passed away for your school graduate, for your college graduation, for your job, for your pregnancy, everything you have done it. And today you have created a job, a profession for yourself out of love. You can do it. Boss, you are right, I can do it. Yes, you can do it. Everybody learn the skills and you're going there to learn the skills. So go ahead and do it. Yes, boss, I will go and win it. And I will learn everything. And that's how I continued my journey. I went into the program, I signed up, I joined the program, and this one and a half year of pandemic was a blessing for me, whereby I equipped my skill set in the art and craft of storytelling and also in the business, whereby I feel that, yes, I've become confident and I feel that, yes, no matter what the failure gives me, whatever life will throw at me, I can do it. Thank you and over to you, Eric.
Okay, thank you very much. Wonderful. So that was a personal experience story. Hmm. So, so you've been uh, doing storytelling work throughout the last uh, year and a half? Yes, online, yes. Online. See, so online, so yes, and offline before pandemic. I was mm -hmm. doing in schools mm -hmm. and uh, activity centers. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some storytellers who don't like to work on online and, uh, you know, have taken a, have taken a, a vacation from storytelling work. Uh, d during this past year or so, and they're looking forward to the, uh, you know, to to getting back to to uh, being able to actually be in the same place with people. But uh, of course, it's a it's a wonderful thing if one uh, enjoys the the online method also. Yeah, because in this one and a half years of online experience, I realized that. Uh, uh, no medium is less. No mm -hmm. medium is less. You can deliver a good story, even online. Uh, and I have listened to great storytellers online. In fact, this whole community of storytellers, I was introduced only because pandemic happened. Before that, I didn't yeah. knew there's someone called Eric Miller from Chennai. There's someone called uh, Gita Ramanujan. I didn't know who was Gita Ramanujan before COVID happened. I didn't know who is, uh, who are the great storytellers from South India. And there's so many. Uh, there is Sri Karuna here. So I can see her. I didn't know her. I didn't know any storyteller. I didn't even know anything about storytelling uh, industry or world. Who are they? I just had the passion of telling stories to my son. And I, uh, I did one for professional course uh, in storytelling when I went to Delhi. And she was the only storyteller I knew. And I discovered her on Facebook only. And my journey started. And I feel in online, I have grown a lot because every day I've been, uh, obviously, personally, I tell stories to my son every day. But professionally, when you tell stories, you have an added responsibility because you are taking care of other children. You are responsible what you transfer to your stories to them. And I have been in Korea. I have been taking sessions from different storytellers. And I've been increasing my skill sets and practicing them and failing and then learning and relearning. So for me, online was a blessing. I really feel that I have grown as a storyteller uh, because of pandemic, because I crafted my skill sets. See, I don't really identify as a as a storyteller myself. Uh, I identify as as a little bit of a scholar and especially as a trainer. Um, and now uh, working with storytelling therapy, but uh, but you know I've been working with storytelling and video conferencing for for twenty five years, uh, and the first twenty three and a half I was the uh, I was the ugly duckling. <laughs> No, nobody really wanted to hear about it, but uh, suddenly, somehow, the, the times have, have caught up with me. Yeah, you know, even uh, I would also like to say that even while practicing and learning and relearning, I have realized that more than an effective storyteller, I am a better trainer. Hmm. And uh, uh, this reflect, self-reflection came while telling stories, training story, storytellers, young storytellers. I work only with children, mm. children up to 16 years of age. And when they tell stories, which really, uh, because I feel if a story has been told to you and it stays in your mind at least for three days, even mm. for uh, one day after the delivery, that means the storyteller has done a job. And this is my personal belief. And there are certain children who have, whom I have trained and the way they tell stories, this, this stays in my heart and my mind at least for two to three days. And I feel they are far more better, great performer than I am. So this is a self-reflection that I, I feel that I am a better trainer than a, than a teller. 
So I can empathize with you, Eric. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll tell a story once in a while. Uh, I, um, I I told the story of, of Siliparigaram, the, the epic of the ankle bracelet uh, someplace online. And um, I told an imaginary story about meeting Donald Trump uh, some, some months ago. Uh, if you want the links, uh, send me an email, I'll, I'll send you the links. But, um, you know, when you, when you enjoy talking about storytelling more than actually storytelling, then you know that you're a trainer. Uh, yes. Yes, but Eric and Kush, I would have to say, though, they say the best teachers are also storytellers. And if I talked about the hidden listener, I'm going to say uh, vouch for the hidden storyteller. Mm -hmm. And um, because you you and um, uh, uh, Kushbo, I think my apologies if I'm getting your name wrong. It comes out in the story. It when you're explaining something to somebody, you have to condense it, shape it into a narrative and then explain to it and to do it over the Internet. Like you mean. Eric, what you've done is open up the door to train a whole new medium of uh, uh, train people to take advantage of a whole new medium. Mm -hmm. It's like taking up an instrument that nobody ever paid attention to before. And now we're having fun with it. You know, of course, it's different. Communication by this method is, is different from uh, communication when you're physically present with someone, but each one has its own strong points and weak points. And, uh, you know, my teacher, my storytelling teacher, has really challenged me to, um, to make the most of video conferencing. Uh, Laura Sims, who, uh, you know, uh, for years was not at all a fan of video conferencing, but she challenged me to, to make it as meaningful as, as possible. So uh, I, owe, I owe a lot to her for that, uh, for that, uh, for her skepticism. You know, I always feel that whether in a classroom uh, or in, in any situation, the more give and take, the more conversation, the better. Uh, the, the, so, but even when we're telling a story, of course, we're getting feedback from our from our listeners. So, the, the more there's interactivity, uh, I, I feel the, the the communication is is better with with more as much of different types of interactivity, uh, the, the better. Okay, we have two more stories. Shall we? Shall we go on? Pratibha, uh, there you are. You've been patiently uh, uh, participating in the conversation for the whole session. Thank you so much. So, uh, so now please uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you're telling from and please tell us a story. Eric, it was a pleasure hearing all the stories. Um, great insights developed through them. Good evening all. And uh, as Norman said, I call upon Krishna first, surrender unto him, and then begin my story. So, mental illness. Now, moving from mythology, love stories, let us talk about mental health. Mental illness is such a hushed up matter, only addressed in the last moment. Being a psychologist, I had been a listening board to many stories of melancholy. I wonder as to how many of us are aware about the struggle undergone in these stories. As I firmly believe that greater the awareness, more the empathy and faster is the healing process. The story that I shall be narrating today is a self-written story and is one such attempt to understand what goes on in the world, in their world, what goes on in their lives. Tim Harris. Tim Harris had always been a bright and an outspoken boy. He was very affectionate, very caring. He was an all-time favorite of his teachers. 
as he excelled in sports and academics too. Keep sports as your last priority. Tim, this is your crucial year of sports. Studies and only studies should be your main focus now, wrote Tim's father, Mr. Harris. Tim wondered as to why his father had been unusually strict since the beginning of this academic year. Why just his father? His mother too had become stern regarding his routine. So ultimately Tim spent his entire day studying with no other activity or any sport. His friend's entry home was restricted too. As months rolled by, Tim began to feel uneasy and frustrated. He became fidgety and could no longer focus on his studies. He was constantly reminded, rebuked, and reminded of what he should be doing with his precious time. This made him feel agitated. And soon, Tim began to spend his entire day behind the shut doors of his room either playing digital games or sleeping. This behavior was observed by Mr. Harris. He decided to have a word with Tim. Tim initially overreacted, created a showdown, but ultimately broke down. He cried, Father, I don't feel like doing anything at all. Life has become so boring and meaningless for me. Life is so empty. In response to this, Mr. Harris kept convincing Tim as to why he needs to excel in his academics, in his career at this point of his life. And when Tim didn't seem to understand, he dismissed Tim's talks as lame excuses and barged out of the room. And Tim, well, he spent his entire day sleeping with a feeling that his father had demeaningly labeled him as crazy and good for nothing. But as his father never even uttered those words, Tim could not appear for his exams. He took a drop that year. His routine never changed. This was his new norm and was of a great concern to his parents. They decided to talk it out with Tim. Of course, with utmost care as they loved him dearly and did not want to offend him. But things took a U-turn, and with the slightest trigger, Tim became aggressive, defensive, stormed out of his room and the house, and marched upstairs to the terrace of his multi-storied apartment. His parents had felt very despondent that day, and they decided to consult a therapist right away. With the appointment scheduled over the weekend, Tim's father felt hopeful for Tim now. Finally, the day arrived when Mr. Harris, panting his way through the stairs, reached the therapist's office that was on the second floor. He was sweating all over, but that hardly bothered him. His keenness and desperation to talk to the therapist was clearly visible as he marched straight towards her cabin, only to be interrupted at the reception to fill in his personal details. Every delayed moment increased his anguish by leaps and bounds. Finally, he entered the cabin of the therapist. As he entered, 
he pulled out a newspaper cutting that was partly folded and he placed it on the therapist's table. The visible part of this cutting displayed a picture of a young boy. Pointing out at the picture, Mr. Harris said, Ma'am, this is Tim, my boy. He has been feeling strange since a long time. Can you please help him? He says he is not interested in doing anything at all. He sleeps for the entire day. Fear, hopelessness, emptiness constantly hover around him. It was my fault that I mistook his expressions as excuses for laziness. Until one day, one day, he tried to jump off from the terrace of my multi-story apartment. Oh, I see. Uh, has, has Tim come along? I would certainly want to speak to him, said the therapist. Ah, yes, he has, said Mr. Harris, directing her towards the window. Look, there he is standing under that tree on that road, waiting for my signal to come in here. The therapist, along with the newspaper cutting, walked towards the window and looked. Where? She asked. As she saw that the road and the tree were completely deserted. Why? Can't you see my boy standing there under that tree? exclaimed Mr. Harris. Just then, the therapist unfolded the folded part of that newspaper cutting, and she looked aghast. It was the obituary column of them. Mr. Harris, I think you have come just on time she said, handing over a glass of water to him. So for the ones who are going through this struggle, these words come from the core of my heart. Go to the place inside where it hurts. The part that feels lonely and sad, your broken heart, your bruised ego. Go there now and say this silently. May you be happy. May you be filled with love. May you be safe. You are not alone. Thank you. Thank you very much. So do I understand that in the story, the, the person who was talking to the therapist, that parent thought he saw his son, but his son had really passed away? Yes. And he was always under that impression that his son is still alive. And he had, he was feeling guilty about how he dismissed his talks, how he had not taken action earlier. Mm. And maybe um, this may turn into schizophrenia. That's a psychotic break. Yes. Mm. So um, I'm a psychologist and I uh, do uh, come across such cases hmm. um, wherein uh, the parents are really troubled. They don't know what to do. It's not as extreme as committing suicide, but then the child is really very, uh, very much in pain and uh, the parents don't know what to do. They are completely lost. 
because uh, the child is in no position to listen to either the parent or anyone. So we just have to listen to the child and and try to find a way to help the child express herself and and I think we need to be consistently supporting the child. Mm. Maybe uh, there's a way that we can talk to the child, not uh, negating him instantly, but finding way through to make him uh, explore what is the reality or what's the truth. So um, that is uh, that needs a lot of uh, tact. And the parents uh, who always like, uh, definitely they uh, have good intentions and uh, they love their uh, child. So um, they just don't want any harm to come to the child. And they but are they, overprotective about the child. Overprotective and they might have so much anxiety that that, that anxiety it will not have a good effect on the child either. Right, right, very true. Hmm. It was such a yeah need of the day story is what I would say for uh, most of the parents to listen to. And I like the part when you finish it off and you said, you know, you are not alone. I think that is the kind of assurance each and every one of us need at a different point of time. Not only the children, even as adults, at times we kind of feel like, okay, I don't have anyone to listen to me or wish I had another person like who can think like me and understand me the way I'm thinking. So uh, your story was so very relatable, uh, I think, to most of us. Thanks for that, uh, Pratibha. Lovely that story, a... Pratibha. I'm sorry if somebody else is going on. Please carry on. Oh, thank you. Uh, there's a powerful story, and it spoke to me. Um, and it reminded me of the precept at the children's hospital in the garden I was at, which sounds very simple and obvious. But it and it, it it goes, it is at the wound that the healing begins, which is to say you cannot separate oneself from the wound. And but one must need have help. And uh, that is what your story spoke to me about. Thank you. I Lovely. think this is a storytelling just to have him always with the clipping. So the clipping's there and it's, it's this hidden thing of suspense. He always has it and you just, as, and then when he comes back to it, you think it just, just when, just when it's coming back, just when you have him look out there and just when she sees it, you know that he's, she's not going to see anyone. So it's right then you have that whole, oh, oh my God. And then you have the expl explanation of the clipping. And nothing was ever told. I was always with you right then on that in that moment. So thanks a lot, so much, so well. And Krishna was with you. So there you go. Thank you. David. Well, you know, there's different uh, approaches to working with a, a a client who's having a psychotic break. One approach is to um, not challenge the the fantasy that the that the client is having, but um, uh, you know, kind of go along with it and work with it, because if you if you challenge the fantasy, uh, the, the the person might get mad, might leave might leave the the therapy process altogether. Uh, so sometimes you have to um, you have to enter the fantasy and 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 work with it. Someone has a child who's uh, <laughs> who's giving a commentary also. Uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, you know, sorry, let sorry, me just Eric. say one more thing that, that there's a there's been a great deal of of mental uh difficult challenges with with especially with teenagers over this year and a half who are um you know in this process of becoming independent individuals but suddenly they've been stuck in their room for a year and a half uh in their parents home uh and they may have a computer they may have a cell phone but uh there's been a lot of um, um, a lot of depression, uh, a lot of different things that are, that have been going on. 
and we just hope that people can can work their way out of it. I think the gadgets have played a big role in causing this. Which plays a, which plays a big role? The gadgets, the digital gadgets, the computer. But but the, but there's a positive computer. side too because they, uh, they, they. I have a 14 year old daughter myself. She is talking to her friends every evening, having a great time. They're talking away. They're yelling. They're screaming. They're they're laughing. So um, you know, some some young people are finding a way to have relationships and uh, develop their 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 lives even through the gadgets. Yeah, it's a blessing in the COVID times, uh, but it needs to be regulated. If you know how to regulate the usage, then I think uh, it's a that's, that's the difficult part. Maybe you can advise me on that later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, shall we? Did I anyone else? Go to, ahead. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I'm not able to uh, switch on my video. Kindly excuse me because I have two kids who have come here to play with the puppets and all. They were the that's behind. okay. Go ahead. All right. Uh, Pratiba, thank you for such a a lovely story that really got connected with my life. I have lost my one of my brothers, the same situation. Mm -hmm. And my mother held my father to be the responsible person. And it happened till her last breath. So my father once confessed that he never wanted his son to be lost or something like, but that was a kind of a thing that I could understand. Maybe the therapist when he was talking to and my father talking to me and telling that, this was a situation I underwent and I went finding morning I saw that your brother is no more. So this was something I was really touched and moved and I was thinking, oh my God, what today is happening? Something all surrounding around me only, <laughs> something like that. These thoughts and the words that came in the story, it was so spontaneous. Like always I was yearning to spread this word around that what struggles the parents or the family's face, like each one needs to know actually. So that, as I said, uh, you can be empathetic towards that person. Otherwise uh, it's difficult for the healing process to begin. True. Pandi Rajan, your mic is, is, uh, is off. Ah, very nicely told. And uh, your narration was so effective. And the pace at which he told the story, uh, and uh, you yourself were emotional, though as if you are uh, hearing it for first time. Only the listeners should feel that way. But as a storyteller, though you have prepared it and you are aware of it, uh, when you are telling the story, I could feel that you are totally affected by that time when he said that. When he saw his son was not there under the tree, uh, you are totally moved. And I could understand how come a storyteller is moving that much. It was natural. It is not that you are acting. Uh, it was great. That, that makes your storytelling very effective. That is the secret of your uh, effective way of telling this. And, and that was a story that Pratibha uh, composed. That was a, an original fictional story as uh -huh. is our next and final story that uh, Shri is going to tell. Shri, are you ready? You better, you got to turn your mic on. Yes. Am I there you are. You're, yes, you are. Yes, you're, you are. Uh, did anyone else want to say anything else about Pratipa's story or can we go on? Is it okay? We can go. Good. Okay, so Shri, uh, please tell us where you're telling from. Introduce yourself and uh, uh, please tell us a story. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for all your patience to wait till the last story of the evening. And thank you, Eric, for this wonderful opportunity, my first time in, in this platform, on this platform. I am Shri Karuna from Vishakhapatnam, but today I'm at my parents' home in Hyderabad. I'm telling this story to you all. Vasudha entered the kitchen, and she just kept the saucepan on the stove and poured some water uh, into the saucepan and she added some tea leaves and she started pounding the ginger and then she suddenly remembered let me switch on some music and uh, she saw for her cell phone here and there and 
uh, she opened her cell phone and she chose her favorite album and then she connected a bluetooth speaker and out of the bluetooth speaker the song started coming in along with the song she started humming chinni chinni aasha chinna dani aasha muddu muddu aasha muttyamanta aasha ear rehman's first song when he was just 18 years old and she went back when she was in college and when she heard that song and how her daughter also loves the same song and there was a smile on her face and suddenly from the bedroom there was a call what's the da it was sundar calling her her husband yes yes i'm getting your tea i know i know you like it with ginger no no i called you for something else important what is that you remember i told you to talk to vasudha yeah i remember i'll talk to her you better do it i'm going to the temple after drinking tea when vasudha comes from office please talk to her and convince her your mother and daughter both of you share a special bond and i think only you can convince her suddenly that chinni chinni aasha rehman's music the aroma of the ginger tea nothing was working on vasudha her face was crushed fallen she went back into the kitchen and then she put a kettle for water to warm for her daughter because her daughter liked herbal tea and any moment she can come back from the office sundar stepped out of the house pulling a door behind him and then vasudha went into the balcony in the balcony she saw all the beautiful plants that her daughter had set up painted on the pots uh, with vegetable colors and uh, all that floral uh, designs and again slowly slightly her face the smile started returning back and she looked out of the balcony and to the far horizon what she could see was only a green canopy of trees again she remembered it was priya her daughter who chose that flat and that balcony overlooking that green canopy of trees she said mom you are a nature lover the first thing you do early in the morning is you want to look at trees and the green color and i think this is the best flat and meanwhile the doorbell rang she knew it was priya she ran to the door and opened the door I entered giving her back to her mom how was your day mom and she gave her a hug my day was fine shall i get you your herbal tea just a minute mom let me freshen up and then vasudha brought the herbal tea gave it to priya and said what do you have for dinner priya today shall i make you pasta mom pasta you making for me pasta i think you want me to agree to something that you're going to say else you never like italian food oh priya you know me very well yes there is something i need to talk to you what is it mom it will take some time priya i need your time away from your uh, you know i need your complete attention Okay, mom. Just give me five minutes on the way in the cab. I just got a call. I need to send this urgent mail. Let me send it from my laptop, and then we'll sit and talk. She quickly worked on her laptop. She sent the mail, and she said, "Mom, now I'm all yours, in ears and in attention, listening to you. Tell me what it is." Look, you know, Manohar uncle. They shifted from Hyderabad to Isaac, and uh, you played with their son Murli. Yes, I know. So, what is it about? Actually, Manohar uncle was uh, mentioning to your dad that Murli has just completed his post graduation in management from Indian School of Business. That's really prestigious, isn't it? Yes, it is prestigious, and I know about it. Murli posted it on Facebook. So, what about it? No, Manohar uncle had a talk with dad, and they have the intention of. Uh, uh you and uh, what you people started match making for me and murali no mom and have just started you know my startup and it's just in the incubation stage 
please, mom, I need to take it to great heights. Give me some time. I'm not ready yet for marriage. I know what's, uh, I know Priya, what's that said. But, you know, someday you will have to get married. And when you are ready, the day you want to get married, the grooms or the boys are not like, you know, so and so a model of phone that you need so much of your uh, GB memory and such a uh, pixel camera and, you know, of this height and you should have sense of humor. So you just can't pick off features and you can't pick him up from the shop window. I know, mom, that boys are not available in shops, but that doesn't mean I'm ready for marriage. But Vasudha, your dad is from IIM and Murali is just like your dad. And he's from ISB. He's intelligent. He's good looking. And you know him from childhood. When you're ready for marriage, I mean, we have to look out of our community and somewhere, some unknown people, we don't know how they are. But this family, we have known all the while. Why don't you consider this? Mom, if he's like that, if he's intelligent, if he's good looking, does this criteria? Priya alone is enough. Why? You love your dad, right? Mom, yes. I love my dad. Like a daughter loves a dad. Yes, he's caring and he's paranoid. When I don't return from office, he has 20 missed calls on my phone. He takes care of me. He takes care of you. He takes care of the house. But what but was it that? Mom, do you love dad? What kind of question is that, Vasudha? Tell me, mom, honestly, do you love dad? Every wife loves her husband, Vasudha. No, mom. Love is not like that. Do you know the meaning of love? What are we talking about, Priya? Vasudha said. It is companionship, mom. I never saw dad sharing a cup of coffee with me. I never saw him, you know, appreciating the same songs that you liked. I never saw him sitting next to you and you both watching a movie together. Yes, you both attend functions. You both go out. And for the society, you're man and wife. And people think you're made for each other. You're very cordial and very amicable amicable people come home you play good host and hostess but there is a lot of emptiness because you both don't think alike and you are a great dancer mom you had given so many so many programs before your marriage the dad i love you to continue your fan for bharatanatyam Vasudha didn't know what to do. Mom, and you said whether I love dad. Yes, I love dad. Same like you said, that every wife loves her husband. Like every daughter, I love dad. But was he there, mom? Was he there for every birthday party of mine? Was he there, really, for every pity of mine? It was you. It was you who attended every PTF. It was you who took me to the doctor when I was sick. It was you who came for my birthday party, talked with my friends, dropped the friend at home. You were planning in advance. It was you who understood my passion for, you know, starting my own business. It was you who took a gold loan and supported me when dad asked me to take up a job. And that being there is what I need, mom. I'm not looking for husband. You know what a marriage is? A marriage is nurturing of two souls, enriching each other, growing, I mean, empowering each other, encouraging each other. And I don't want another dad as, a, as my home mom. He could be intelligent. He could be. You're earning well, he could be great looking, but no, I don't envision him as my partner. Give me some time, mom. I know the right person will walk into my life.
and now I have a webinar to attend. Please let me go into my room. Priya walked into her room and Vasudha entered the kitchen. And then the doorbell rang. Sundar entered the house just then. Vasudha heaved a sigh of relief. Thank God he didn't hear this conversation. And she made some pasta, gave to her daughter and her husband. She made some rotis and because he doesn't like Italian either. And she made both the dinners and so. And she was waiting with bated breath. When he'll come and he'll ask, did you talk to Priya? Did she say yes? But no. She didn't hear him asking that. She thought, what happened? Why is he not asking me? And then all of a sudden, he said, come, Vasudha, come, sit here. And she saw, oh my God, now he's going to ask me, what will I tell her, tell him? But she said, no, how will I convince him? I'm caught between the father and daughter. I know Priya is right, but how will I convey this to him? He said, come, sit here. Instead of sitting in my why is this up? Asking me to sit beside him, she wondered. And said, come, let us watch a film together. Said, what? No, no, I just thought you might like this. And he switched on one of favorite movies, which was humor. And he started laughing at the joke, what was happening in the movie. And when she looked at him laughing, she wondered, did he hear this conversation from outside the door? Whether he heard or whether he didn't, it didn't matter to her. But when she saw his laughing face, she went down the memory lane 25 years back when they were newlyweds and life was beautiful like this. And he would sigh of relief. Thank you. That's the end of the story. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us what a marriage should be. Thank you, Eric. Especially I in the uh, hmm? Can I say one line? Yeah, especially in this pandemic, when I heard that uh, lots of couples are fighting more because they are now staying, the software couples, or they're staying at home. There was a lot of friction because uh, earlier they went their own ways and they didn't spend time together. And But now when they had to share the codes or anything, there's a lot of friction and all that triggered for me to write this story about mm -hmm. marriage, matchmaking and partnership and all this. So that's the motivation for me to mm -hmm. write this fictitious story. Ambuja, what were you going to say? I was going to say another, like how Pratibha's uh, story, I kind of felt like need of the art. This is another story, you know, like, um, especially in this pandemic, relationships are what are more important, very, very important. And, uh, you know, being, staying with the um, same person throughout the day, you know, years to get, I mean, it's like one and a half years or so. I, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, deep diving into this is required to maintain the relationship skills. So thank you very much. Thank you, Amritya. Um, Shri, uh, what I, my favorite part of the story was, or the, it's hard to pick it out, but um, was when they agreed to have a dialogue together. He says, let me finish this. I will talk to you. There's obviously some foundation of trust and communication there to build upon. And um, so it gave me hope at least maybe something good will come of it.
and uh, there is this line about you most of us uh, are uh, just existing we're breathing we're eating and we're existing but in one telugu i mean sometimes one lang- language cannot be exactly translated into another but in that telugu story i had read this that most of our existing very few of us are living that's another motivation for me the marriages but they're not fairy tales like you know that happily ever after uh yes there are marriages happening with great aplomb and splendor the big fat indian weddings and uh, yes uh, the best of the photo shoots happen and anniversary pictures are posted on social media and everything but there are people i'm telling about my generation or the uh, you know younger generation who are who are just married for two three years or four years i have known my parents generation people like you know who just live like strangers under the same roof they're not able to forgive each other just because according to the society taking a divorce is not right being a, called a divorcee is not right in in those times in india or whatever but I have literally seen husband and wife living as strangers under the same roof there's also one more trigger that made me you know write the story and uh, even parenting as yes, for that matter in petty bars like both the parents there's so many uh, places when where the father feels he's earning and bringing home the bucks and uh, that's where his role ends so once he comes he puts up his legs and uh, you know watches tv and you know it's his time to relax it's only the mothers who are there with the children truly being there with them this also i have seen it's all like whenever we write a story we take bits and pieces of what we see around us they don't come from the net so <laughs> lots of things <laughs> uh, this uh, reminded me of a conversation with my friend yeah go on and yeah so this reminded me of a conversation of my friend who had with one of her friends so uh, he is he's probably like 45 ish well educated well to do um, is my internet okay yes you able to hear me? it's fine yes. go ah, ahead okay. so uh, what yeah so what he was saying is uh, exactly whatever uh, shri said now he said i just want to read out the conversation because she shared it with me i don't believe in divorce and she asked him why and he said divorce is a very western concept and it's against our culture i was like what what are you talking what do you mean he said yeah marriages are made in heaven so you got to make it work no matter what and she said let me get this straight so you mean even if i'm abused disrespected miserable in my marriage i have to stay and he said these days women are overreacting and laws are clearly protecting them so now we need to start fighting for men's right and he says an lol and your story just brought back this conversation as to um, how people just trivialize whatever happens and in the name of the society uh, abuse be it physical verbal emotional is is like taken for granted and it is not just for women it is also for men uh, a lot of men also go through this um, in the hands of women and i think more so for the men because they are um, sandwiched between the mother and the wife and they don't know what to do because of our societal uh, structure of marriage so i think the way you i mean the story really brings out a lot of points that you go go just go on thinking and then i think you just need to join the dots and see what suits you and do the best for yourself and don't think about the society per se so thank you so much shri for this lovely story i like the um the in terms of the storytelling i think the moment at the end when when she looks at his smile and his laugh and he's not paying attention to her 
but she sees that and that rekindles, that reminds her, which, which after all this conversation also means that the woman's doing the work. The woman's looking at it and feeling the love again. But, but it was nice to just see that it was there. They just had to be reminded. And if you put it in the right situation, there's hope that something can be rekindled or reborn or reseen. That it's not just black and white. It's a it's 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 a process that 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 if you put the right thing, nudge it in the right thing, and she does it. She says, "Come on, let's let's do this," because she's the wise one. And in doing that, he's she's able to bring out the child and the young man, and and then she was able to feel the love and just see that and remember what it was there. So that was a lovely moment, especially a lovely moment to end the story on. So I thought, well, there is hope. You don't have to get yeah. divorced all the time. So thanks. I, I wanted to end it with hope and uh, positivity. Definitely. Yeah, and you did. That was my intention. Well done. Wonderful. Okay, I, I'm going to stop the recording now.